I'm so joyful to be here uh, in Beit Tehila. And uh, my wife has repeatedly said that this is one of our highlights to be in Beit Tehila. Uh, we actually built the whole tour around coming here, being with you. And it's really a big, uh, a big honor and joy for us to be here with you and, uh, and feel you, be with you, talk to you. Um, and uh, I, 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 it's, I think it's important uh, with, with, with that joy and happiness also to mention that uh, today the uh, Jewish people is commemorating the 17th day of the month, the Hebrew month of Tammuz. Uh, and that day is a, not a happy day, but actually a sad day. Uh, it's the day that the walls of Jerusalem were breached. And it starts the period of three weeks of mourning that end, culminate with the ninth of Av, uh, which is the, uh, the destruction of the first temple and the second temple. So I would like to start in order to, to, bring, to lift us and, and make us make, bring a lot of hope to us. I would like to, to say the blessing that we say three days, three times a day. Uh, from the 18th benediction prayer. To Jerusalem, your city, may you return in compassion, and may you dwell in it as you promised. May you rebuild it rapidly in our days as an everlasting structure, and install within it soon the throne of David. Blessed are you, Lord, who builds Jerusalem. Amen. As Jerusalem is in our heart all the time, um, a, a Jewish groom standing under the chuppah has to say, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, this is an integral part of our identity, of our spirituality. So uh, we will be talking about Israel, and I know a lot of you, all of you, love Israel, support Israel, and um, but I, I'm warning you, you're going into a roller coaster um, the the, the I, I can I can say that at least the next two hours that are going to deal with the past are going to maybe shake your world um, and uh, before I start I know you know my my place in in the land of Israel aside from Jerusalem is Joshua's altar and and I, I, many of you have been at Joshua's altar with us you, you felt how special that place is. And uh, I, I was there, you know, for the first time, maybe six or seven years ago. But since then, uh, because I've been dealing with it and reading about it, personally, I started noticing things in the Bible that I haven't noticed in the past. Um, personally, just reading the Bible, seeing how the altar is connected to so many things that I've never noticed before. So I'm going to share that with you. The second thing that happened is that I met other people like me who also love the altar, who also love archaeology. And they shared with me their insights. And I shared my insights with them. So suddenly there's a discussion among us and we are enriching ourselves as to how important that site is. So with your permission, I will dedicate um, 10 minutes just to recap Joshua's altar, uh, briefly to, to talk about it and, and what it is. Um, the blessing of the, 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 bless, the ceremony of the blessings and the curses on Mount Ibal is probably after Mount Sinai, the most important ceremonies that the Israelites did in the Pentateuch, in the five books. Um, it's a, a covenant that was done not in Mount Sinai in the desert. It's a covenant that was done in the land of Israel. It's, it's the commitment of the Israelites to believe in God and to fulfill his commandments, but also an understanding that if they don't follow God's commandments, they will be punished. 
the God is looking at us all the time. He's all the time watching us. And many of the curses that are uttered between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are curses for actions that are done in hiding. You know, you think, you know, you, you, in the outside you, you're righteous, but inside you think no one's looking, so you do whatever you want. So in the land of Israel, when you have a house, it's not a tent, it's a house now, and a room, you have a place to hide? No. God is looking. God is watching. And you have to commit to God that you will follow his rules. So this ceremony is so important. And we know that the Bible doesn't repeat stuff all the time. They, the Bible is very, very, um, it makes, it makes things very clear and short and it doesn't go into too many details. Um, but here we have twice a, a description of the ceremony that is supposed to happen in Canaan at Mount Ibal. So let's start with the first. So this is Deuteronomy 11. The Israelites are not yet in the land of Canaan. They are on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And they are listening to Moses. Moses is giving his last words in the book of Deuteronomy. And Moses says, the first thing you do when you go into the land of Israel is not to go to Jericho and conquer Jericho, not to go to Ai. The first thing you do, you go to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ibal, and you do the ceremony. And where is that ceremony? Moses is very clear. I'm going to give you, you know, Israel, Israelites, you don't have a GPS on your, on your cell phones, okay? You want to know exactly where it is, so there's no mistakes, I'm going to tell you. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ibal, as you know, are across the Jordan, westward toward the setting sun, near the great trees of Moreh, in the territory of those Canaanites living in the Arabah, in the vicinity of Gilgal. Very clear, okay? To them. Um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to use Google Earth to, to show you exactly what we're talking about, what, where, where exactly it is. Ready? This is not my drone. You know I love drones. Uh, this is, we'll, see, we'll, we'll get to the drones later. Uh, we are zooming into the land of Israel, and what we see in the middle is Judea and Samaria. Uh, Judea is to the south, Samaria is to the north. Okay, this is Samaria, this is Judea. The Israelites are east of the Jordan River, and we are looking right now at the city, the Arab city of Nablus. The Arab city of Nablus is not Shechem. Shechem is, is a small small circle here that we cannot see from here. This is Mount Ibal, and this is Mount Gerizim. So um, if we want to, to, to get another, we're going, we're going to see another angle of these two mountains, Mount Ibal and Mount Gerizim. By the way, you see this is the summit. On the summit, there is a, an Israeli army base. So when, when we go with Beit Tehila, to visit Joshua's altar, we go up to the army base, we go around it, and then we go to the altar. But where is the altar? Okay, so here's the problem. When people looked for the altar, they did not look at the right place. Okay, they looked at the Bible, we're talking about Christian archaeologists in the 19th century, they looked at the Bible, they imagined that the ceremony took place between the two mountains. Half of the tribes stood here, half of the tribes stood here, the Ark of the Covenant and the priest in the middle, and that's where the ceremony, the blessings, and the curses happen. Now, God commands Joshua to build an altar. Where? On which mountain? Mount Ibal, right? Many people say Mount Gerizim because Gerizim is the blessing. Why does God command the, the altar to be built on the mountain of curse? Okay, 
Remember that question? If I forget to answer, ask me. I think I know the answer. Um, and so they were looking for the altar on the southern slopes of the mountain, right here. And guess what? It's not there, okay? Let's see another angle. Some crazy guy flew his drone above Nablus, the Arab city of Nablus. You know, I don't know who that was. It's totally crazy. Um, so what we see here is the slopes of Mount Ibal. This is the slopes of Mount Gerizim. And here, you see this hollow area, this vacant area? This is ancient, the ancient city of Shechem. Okay, this is Tel Shechem. Now, obviously, the ancient city was bigger, but you, you have the walled city, and you have the houses out, outside of the walled city. So the walled city is exactly this area right here. By the way, we're passing the, the tomb of Joseph down here. Okay, but this is Tel Shechem. And the archaeologists are looking for the altar here because this is where the ceremony should have happened. Okay, but no altar. So they write in their reports, maybe it was destroyed, maybe someone built something on top of it, and they continue on. The problem is that later on in the 1960s in Europe, you have archaeologists that are saying, of course, you didn't find the altar because the story never happened. Okay, these are atheist archaeologists that are saying Joshua never existed, Moses never existed, the Exodus never happened, and this school of thought, which is called the minimalist school in archaeology, or as I like to call it, the minimalist school, has taken over the academic world, okay? Um, and they, that's, that's been going on from the 1960s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. Aaron Lipkin, a small, sorry, a handsome <laughs> guy in high school, okay, learning Bible. Okay, we have Bible classes in school, okay, but this is a secular Jewish school, and our teacher looked at us and said, that all the stories in the Bible are made up. Yes, this is a school in Jerusalem, a Jewish school. She said, I remember, I remember the, sh the first shock, book of Genesis, the creation. She says, all these stories, they're Babylonian, they're Assyrian. And the Israelites took them and made up a monotheistic religion. But this is the spirit of that school of thought that came from Europe and said, Not, there's no evidence for the Exodus, there's no evidence for any of the stories. And I, I, I want to tell you one, something that's deeper that I've never said before. Why are they saying that? They're atheists. God does not exist. And if God does not exist, miracles don't happen. The Exodus could not have happened because a nation cannot escape Egypt. There's no such thing. You cannot cross the sea, the Red Sea. You cannot do that. You cannot, uh, uh, you cannot have prophecy because God doesn't exist. So there's no, no conversation there. Okay, so this whole book is a mythology. That's how they see it. Um, and so when they hear the reports of the archaeologists, the Christian archaeologists from the 19th century, they're saying, of course you didn't find it. it never happened. Let's continue. Second time that the ceremony is mentioned, again, in the book of Deuteronomy, and we are talking about Deuteronomy 27. And here we have more details. I haven't, I did not include all the, the verses here because it's very long. Uh, it talks about the ceremony, which blessings, sorry, which curses should be uttered, uh, who, and, and how they should say amen to each of the curses. Uh, and you're, you're more than invited to look at them. But the reason why I am mentioning that is because, as I said, the ceremony on Mount Ibal is equivalent to Mount Sinai. The Jewish sages 
are saying that this is maybe even more important than Mount Sinai, okay? And as we progress, you will, you will understand why. So, uh, when we're looking at this, what do we see? We see, and when you have crossed the Jordan, set up these stones on Mount Ibal as I command you today and coat them with plaster. So we have plaster that is on the altar, okay? Build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. Do not use any iron tool on them. Why not? Say again. That's, that's good. And, and, and the sages are saying, God wants a simple altar. He doesn't, he doesn't want something that is too extravagant. And, and it says in Leviticus, not to build the altar out of cut stone, but of field stones. There's, a, there's a, 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 an altar made out of mud or, or soil. And there is an altar that's made out of stone. The, the altar that's made out of stone should be from field stones. But in Leviticus, it says another thing. It says, the reason why I don't want you to use cut stone is because you are going to use iron to do that. And iron is a tool of war. It sheds blood. You will defile my altar. My altar is a place of peace. So, field stones. And offer burnt offering on it to the Lord your God. Sacrifice fellowship offerings there, eating them and rejoicing in the presence of the Lord your God. And you shall write very clearly all the words of this law on these stones you have set up. So, again, I invite you to see the curses that are uttered there. And it is believed, according to the Jewish tradition, that every curse had a blessing, an opposite blessing. Uh, and they would say amen to each of these blessings and curses. So, if Joshua said, not once, but twice, then you have to do it, right? Moses passes away. Joshua leads the Israelites into the land. And does he go to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ibal? No. Okay, he does. He goes to Jericho, conquers Jericho, conquers Ai, and then, chapter 8, Joshua goes to Mount Ibal to fulfill the commandment. Then Joshua built on Mount Ibal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. He built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There, in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses. All the Israelites, with their elders, officials, and judges, were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, facing the Levitical priests who carried it, both the foreigners living among them and the native-born were there. Did you hear that? Foreigners living among them and native born. Okay, we'll talk about that because if you stop for a second, what is a native born? Someone that was born in the land of Israel. But wait a sec, they just came from Egypt. We'll talk about that. Um, and, uh, and half of them, half of the people stood on, in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ibal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had formally commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. So you understand the Christian archaeologists, when they imagine the ceremony, because they're reading this, they're seeing exactly what the Christian archaeologists you know, saw, they see, see, see them on both sides of the mountains facing each other. That's how it should be. So, the altar was not found. And the academic world has said its word. It is hard to accept, but scholars today are convinced that Israel was not present in Egypt 
nor wandered in Sinai. They did not conquer Canaan, nor inherited to the 12 tribes. And the Israelite religion did not adopt monotheism on Mount Sinai, but at the end of the monarchical period, much after King David. That is a very mainstream view in archaeology. But not, also, not just in archaeology, in sociology, in history. It affects so many fields in the academic world that I remember, you know, when I wasn't, wasn't just a handsome high school student, but I was also a handsome student in, the, in college. And, and when, I, when I worked at the lawyer's office, there was a, a, a beautiful red, sorry, a red-headed girl that worked in my office, and, and she came to me and she said, Aaron, you know, I, I'm learning archaeology in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And you know what they're teaching us? That Moses never existed, that Joshua never existed, that the Exodus never happened. And, and you should know this is not just in, in, in Hebrew University or in the Tel Aviv University or the Haifa University. This is in every university in the world. Okay? And when, and when our children are sent to those universities, if they're not learning archaeology or Bible or history, they are learning other subjects in that spirit. The spirit of atheism, the spirit that doesn't believe in God, that doesn't believe in the Bible. I remember as a kid, sorry, as a, as a student walking in the, in the streets of Jerusalem and suddenly I saw an ad and the ad said a lecture by Professor Adam Sertal from the Haifa University, professor of archaeology. And, you know, you would imagine that under it, it would say the Bible doesn't exist, the, the, the exodus never happened. But no, he is going to speak about Joshua's altar. I said, I have to go and listen to this guy. Maybe, maybe there's something changing. And I went and I fell in love with him. And from that point on, my life has been intermingled, is that the word? With um, Adam Zartal and his life and his project. And, you know, Adam Zartal was not a religious person. He did not believe in God. Uh, he was a left-wing socialist, atheist, who was, who was brought up in a kibbutz. But God chose him because of that. Because he was about to find something that shook the world of archaeology, the biblical world, and this, he was the only one that could bring this forward and promote it. If it was a religious archaeologist, no one would have accepted it. Because relig religious people are not objective, they're subjective. Because they believe in God, they see everything in a certain way. And so you cannot trust their findings. Okay, we'll, get that, we'll get to that later on because I have an a Christian archaeolo archaeologist that is facing the same problems. And we're going to talk about that. So, 1967, Israel liberates Judea and Samaria, the biblical heartland of Israel where all the amazing stories of the Bible were supposed to happen. And Adam Zartal sees an opportunity. He says they're going to bring Judea and Samaria back to the Jordanians and sign a peace treaty. We need to do an emergency survey to check as much ground as possible and see what archaeological finds we can, we can find. Not, not excavate, just walk and look for archaeological sites. And it went for one year, two years, three years, all the way till today. And Adam Zartal and his crew, and today Dr. Shai Bar, who is his disciple, um, are surveying Judea and Samaria and finding amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. So Adam Zartal is walking with his pupils, with his students, on Mount Ibal to survey and check what's going on on this mountain. Now remember, Adam Zartal is not one of those Christian archaeologists. He's not looking for the altar, because the altar doesn't exist. He's just looking for archaeological remains. And he's walking and walking and walking, and suddenly he gets to a weird 
place, okay, he sees this wall, this ancient wall that's going around. And you see this, this area that you see here, and you see the geography. There is no correlation between the height of the mountain, the summit, and the different heights, and the wall. You build wall for terraces usually. But here, the wall didn't, didn't take in account the geography. The shape of the wall had an, a meaning of its own. And Adam Zartar saw this, and he immediately remembered that he already found such a structure close by. And that structure was, was identified from the Israelite period. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to say Israelite period. Um, I can also say Iron Age one. I can also say the year 1250 or 1300 BCE. Okay, it's many, many names for the same period, but let's call it the Israelite period. And he goes in to the compound and suddenly when he gets to this area, he sees thousands and thousands of the most valuable thing for archaeologists. Not gold, not silver, not, not jewelry, not diamonds, pottery. Okay, they see thousands of pottery pieces. They pick them up, they look at them, believe it or not, they taste them, and they say, this is Israelite pottery. This is an Israelite site. There's no other pottery from a different period. This is only Israelite. And at the highest point, they see a big pile of stone. Let's get back to that crazy guy with the drone. So here we see the reconstruction of the wall, okay? you see that there, there's no correlation between the, the wall and the geography. There is a, 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 a descent here, and this is one of our groups visiting the sites. And over here, at the top, the highest place inside that compound, what they see is a pile of stone. So Adam Zartal, this is 1980, Adam says, I need to come back here, I need to check this place up. In 1982, they start the first excavation season, which goes on until 1989. And this, this pile of stone is, is, is weird because what they're starting to do there to excavate is, first of all, they peel away the outer layer of stone. And suddenly, after, after a certain time, they start seeing walls, straight walls, under it. And these walls look, look weird. They, they continue uh, uh, taking away, pe pe taking, peeling the, the outer layer of the stone. And you see this area right here? You see this area? This whole area was sealed at the top. They take away the floor that was on top, and they find inside two meters of ashes and bones. In these two courts, they find vessels that contained vegeta vegeta vegetarian, uh, like seeds and grapes and, 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 and wheat. They see that there is a ramp going up and a secondary ramp on both sides. Adam Zartal is seeing this, and, and he's, you know, in the back of his head, it's not the altar. The altar doesn't exist. It's not it. So what is it? What do archaeologists do? They go to libraries. They like to sit in libraries and look for examples from other cultures. And, he, and Adam Zartal is looking and looking and looking in Egypt and Syria and Babylon. He finds in Babylon... Something interesting, there is a, the, 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 the Babylonian temple, the Zikurat, has certain, 
similarity to the altar, but still it's not it. It's not, that's, <coughs> that's not a zikurat. So Adam Zartal is sitting in the dining hall of Shaveh Shomron, which is the Jewish community nearby Mount Ibal. And he's sketching the, the, the weird structure that he saw. Suddenly, a, an Orthodox Jew walks by, and he knows Adam is working there, that he found something on Mount Ibal. And he's looking, and he's saying, Adam, Professor Zertal, is this what you found on Mount Ibal? And Adam Zertal says, yes, I don't know what it is. And suddenly he sees this Jew, this Orthodox Jew, all on fire, and he runs away from the dining hall. And so Adam Zertal is, is these crazy Jews. What's, what's, what's going on here? And then this guy comes back with a book, a Jewish book, a book from the Mishnah, the oral traditions of the Jewish people that accompany the Torah. And he, he brings the chapter that deals with the shape and the size of the vessels of the second temple. And he opens a certain page. And that page has a picture of the altar in the second temple period. What do we see? We see a ramp. We see a secondary ramp. We see a rectangular shaped square. And the similarity is, is amazing. Adam Zartal sees this, and suddenly you have to understand, a person who was secular, who did not believe in God, did not believe, was not educated to believe that the Bible, the biblical stories are true, is looking at this Orthodox Jew and saying, you understand what this means? This means we found Joshua's altar. And if this is Joshua's altar, then Joshua existed. And Moses and the Exodus happened. And the Orthodox Jew is looking at him and says, of course. Well, this discovery totally changed Adam Zartal's life. And Adam Zartal hoped that this discovery will also change the word of archaeology. And I remember every time that when he got to this point in his lecture, you saw sadness fall on him. Because you saw a person who really, truly believed in science, who believed in the academic world, the objectivity of the academic world, the truthfulness of the academic world, and bumped into reality. The reality of an academic world that is political, that has agendas, that has ideologies that affect their response to such a discovery. Adam Zartal uh, continued serving and uh, he found amazing things. I'm just going to share two things. One is the footprint structures, that one of them is under Mount, uh, around Mount Ibal. Adam Zartal believed that those footprint structures, six to get all together that were found, are the ancient worshiping sites of the Israelites. And he wrote a book about this discovery, and we have it on the table outside. We just printed it. It's, you're the first ones that get to touch the books uh, in, in any church in the world. I mean, we already mailed them to a few people, but you're the first ones. The, the printed books are outside, and you, you, you go through that, and you see how he moves from one point to the other until he scientifically proves that these footprint structures are biblical Gilgal. Okay, you've all heard of Gilgal. He proves that these footprint structures are Gilgal. Um, another important discovery that Zertal and his crew uh, have is the crossing of the Jordan River. Um, one of the uh, problems that the academic world raised is that there is no proof for a crossing of the Israelites in the area of Jericho. In fact, Kathleen Canyon, a, 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 an American archaeologist, um, said that Jericho and I, which she excavated, were already 
in ruins when Joshua came into the land. So there was no way that Joshua um, conquered them. And there is no proof that the Israelites even crossed there. No, nothing. There's just no proof. So, you know, these, these reports come in, and again, they strengthen the minimalist school. And then Adam Zartal comes and changes everything. Okay? They walk, literally walk, every meter, every meter of the Jordan Valley, and they find the crossing point. Okay? Now, the crossing point is not only in Jericho, because we believe that the Bible is true, that the stories there are true, that they happened. But the major crossing was north at the area of the Jabok Pass, near the city of Adam. And they find, from in the late Bronze period, no, almost no settlements. And then when you move to the early Iron Age period, Iron Age 1, you see hundreds of settlements from nowhere. We're talking about an arid area. There's nothing there. And there's, an, there's no other explanation than an invasion. And when you look in the book of Joshua, you see that the waters did not stop in Jericho. Where did they stop? Jabok Pass, Adam. The waters stopped all the way from Jabok down to Jericho. So the Israelites could have passed anywhere on that path, and they chose to, 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 to cross at that point. And I have, my, I, have, I have my own theories why, but we'll, sh we're, we'll share that maybe sometime else. Anyway, um, so this is just, you know, talking about the altar. Just wanted to share that with you so we are on the same line. And now I want to bring you some news about Joshua's altar, something that I haven't shared at all anywhere. Um, and the first is actually sad news. Uh, I don't know how many of you heard, but um, something very sad happened a few, um, a few uh, uh, months ago. I think it was two months ago, three months ago. Um, I sat at my office and I started receiving text messages. And, and uh, the text messages were, did you hear? the Palestinians destroyed Joshua's altar. And this was probably one of my biggest nightmare uh, because the area is really nowhere. It's like forgotten. And I was really afraid that the Palestinians would just come one day and just bulldoze the whole, the whole site. And uh, I immediately uh, connected to all the elements, to all the organizations that are taking care of that, that care about this place. And, um, and this is a... So much more right here on the Joshua and Caleb Report. In a world plagued with anti-Israel propaganda, Hayovel presents the Joshua and Caleb Report, a positive voice of truth straight from Israel's heart. In a world of negativity and fake news, every Christian should be connected to the life and positivity that Israel brings to the world. Welcome to the Joshua and Caleb Report. I'm Luke Hilton here with Joshua Waller. We're talking about Joshua's altar today, a different Joshua, but uh, one that this show is named after. Glad to have you, you along. You might have barely heard about this in the news, and that is that Joshua's altar got damaged and vandalized by the Palestinians, but you probably didn't hear much about it, and guess what? You're only going to have an on-site report from us right here, the Joshua and Caleb report. Joshua were there. What happened first? Palestinian Authority wreaked havoc on the biblical era site of Joshua Ben Nun's altar on Mount Ebal. They actually took rocks from the perimeter wall, the retaining wall, and ground them into gravel to help build their new road. If they, you couldn't get more outrageous, uh, flagrant, <laughs> flagrant. <laughs> let's use it again. Okay. Let's flip yeah. it around. So anyways, here's what happened from the field. The only field report that we know of on the Mount, uh, Mountie ball, Joshua's altar. Here's Josh out at the site this past week. Okay, guys, um, uh, we've just gotten word that, uh, an ancient archeological site that's actually 
near and dear, close to my heart. It's actually Joshua's altar uh, has been uh, has been uh, the wall around it has been broken up by some local Arabs that don't respect the site. So we're gonna go check it out. We're gonna go uh, see what we can do. We're gonna try to uh, document this because obviously this can't be tolerated. We're talking about something that over three thousand years ago that says so clearly that uh, the Jewish people were here. This is literally Joshua's altar that he built with the children of Israel when they first came into the land. Okay, guys, we're here on uh, Har Eval, the Mount of Cursing, the Mount of Blessing, just to uh, just to the south of us. Um, unfortunately, as you can tell behind us, we've had uh, some really horrific. We're talking about history here uh, of the actual altar site. Thank God the altar is untouched just above us, but we actually have a wall that goes around the base of it. We've got Aaron Lipkin here, uh, really professional on the site. Uh, you've taken uh, just a, a lot of your life and, and invested into this uh, cause and trying to bring awareness to this site. Tell us what uh, what happened. It just just literally this destruction just happened. Uh, what, what what are we going to do? Obviously, we're going to try to fix it, but this give is us more details. This is a, a an important holy biblical site for Jews and Christians. Yeah. And what we see here is a total desecration yeah. of of the the principle of respecting other religions. Okay. What we have here are Muslims coming in yeah. and just destroying a a holy compound. A place that 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 used to that had an important biblical ceremony, the ceremony described in Joshua chapter eight, a, a ceremony that was commanded by Moses in Deuteronomy seven and Deuteron Deuteronomy eleven, Deuteronomy twenty seven. Uh, this site is a crucial site, an important site, and it's a holy site. Yeah. It's not just an ancient site; it's a holy site for Jews and Christians. This is the principle of our religion. This is the place where where the Israelites came here and under the commandment of Moses and God. And this is where they uttered the word amen when they heard the commandments mm -hmm. uttered by the high priests. Yeah. This place is the unification of the people, the commandments of God and the land of Israel, mm -hmm. which serve as the base for our faith, the Jewish faith and the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And what happened here is that just because they are paving a road close to here, what they're doing is they need gravel. <laughs> So why not take stones from the holy compound, from the precinct that 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 surrounds the altar of Joshua? Why not just take those stones and use them for the for the for the the road that they're paving? And you know what that reminds me? That reminds me of what happened between 1948 and 1967, yeah. when the Jordanians took the, the tombstones, the tombstones of Jews from the Mount of Olives, the cemetery, and use them for for urination purposes in in, 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 in you know doing places for for like the men's room for the soldiers and the, the Jordanian soldiers. They took the tombstones without with uh, no respect whatsoever for the Jewish people, for the Jewish religion, for the Jewish faith. And this is this is exactly what they're doing. They're coming here and just demolishing everything with with. Total disrespect right. for the Jewish faith, for the Christian faith, and for the Bible. Well, and, all, and I was just talking to the guys on the way here. Uh, you can't get more foundational than this. Literally, the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan, and they come here. Like if our Bible, and what I was telling them, why, why is Joshua's altar so significant? Why is this, this wall surrounding Joshua's, this ancient piece of ground that we're sitting on right now, why is it so significant? I said, because there was, you know, people believed the Bible. They just believed it because they, they did. But when we have factual evidence that says that the Bible was true, it fits the story to a T. The altar here has the the uh, kosher animals, the gear, all the data that's been taken from there fit the biblical picture exactly. Exactly. And even this wall surrounding it fits the biblical it's footprint, and I want you to talk about it in just a second, the biblical footprint that, that matches the children of Israel as they go. So if this is destroyed, the attempt is to destroy evidence that the word of God is actually true. And like you said, Jews and Christians alike, this is something dear to our hearts. And you can tell we're a little bit fired up about this because there's an attack. It's not just against this old wall. 
It's an attack literally against the word of God, right? It's an attack against the, the, the foundations. Really, look, this was here for thousands of years untouched. And just now we have, and what, look at our world today. This is literally our battle that we're in in this generation. It's an attack against the foundations. Not only is, is this, but we're gonna fix this. I mean, this, we got, people are gonna come, we're gonna try to get this fixed, but literally the attack is against the word of God and trying to make it void trying to avoid that picture. But I wanted, to, I wanted you to say, Aaron, quickly, what? why is this outside wall so significant? Because I don't think people understand. Okay, it's just an outside wall, right? but why the outside wall? Right, so you know, when you look from the outside, it just looks like a, a wall of a terrace. Yeah. But what we're seeing here is a reconstruction of an ancient wall that was under it, that was reconstructed by Professor Adam Zartal. Yeah. Professor Adam Zartal found the altar 40 years ago and he found this, this interesting precinct around the altar that looks like a footprint structure. Now he found five more of these structures in the Jordan Valley and in Samaria that were built by the Israelites. And Professor Zavtal believed that these precincts, these walls, these footprint structures, enclosures are actually Gilgal. Gilgal in the Bible is a, a holy compound, a camp, a holy camp that, that served the Israelites for convening, for worshiping God, for sacrificing, for crowning king. So, so this is a Gilgal, this is a footprint structure. The wall has its own importance and significance. The precinct was built to make, make it clear what is holy and what is unholy. We're standing outside of the holy area and from this wall inwards is the holy area. And so, you know, whoever did this, they, they touched the, the essence, the holiness of the Bible and of our belief. Yeah. Amen. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for, we're going to do something about this. We got, we got to. So, uh, but it's our job here to let you guys know what's happening. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. You can see how emotional we were both, both of us so emotional it was so troubling to see it um especially because for me it's really a place that is close to my heart and you understand it now um right after we took that video um we came with a couple of volunteers from Hyovel, christian volunteers and uh, we had volunteers jewish volunteers from the communities in samaria and we worked for hours to to um, restore the wall that was uh, broken and that was i think i think that was that was good um it, you know it says that when pharaoh would um would molest the israelites they even grew bigger and so what happened there was 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 exactly that you saw jews and christians working together to restore the biblical heritage and i'm, I'm telling you a site that was unknown for many Israelis that Israeli politicians never bothered to visit thanks to the Palestinians became a hit. Okay? Now you have, you've all heard of Netanyahu, right? Benjamin Netanyahu. I love Netanyahu. I, I am what's called a Bibist. Bibist is a, a, an arid follower of of, of, of Netanyahu, okay? You, you can't imagine how many problems I have with my mother-in-law. Uh, but but this, is, this is, I really love Netanyahu. And Netanyahu came out with a, a declaration about this terrible deed. And, uh, and also the president of Israel, Ruby Rivlin, also came out with a declaration against this, against the damage that was done to Joshua's altar. And even the current Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, also came out with a video. You want to see it? Hello, everyone. Uh -oh. Imagine if ISIS would try and take apart the Statue of Liberty or the Eiffel Tower. What an uproar across the world we'd hear. Well, I'm standing here on the hills of Samaria on an ancient Jewish site, one of the most ancient Jewish sites ever discovered, 3,200 years old, on Joshua's altar, on Mount Ebal. On this very mountain, 3,200 years ago, the Jewish people 
came out of Egypt, crossed the Jordan River, which is right over there, came up through Nablus and met here for their last central meeting of the Jewish people before spreading across the land of Israel and building our national home over here. A few decades ago, famous archaeologist Adam Zartal discovered this altar and found evidence for it being the original Jewish altar. Unfortunately, just a few days ago, the Palestinian Authority started dismantling this location. That's unbelievable. That's a barbaric act that we've only heard from ISIS and from radical Islamists that want to take away uh, ancient sites of other people. I can tell you now, as former Defense Minister of Israel, we will never let anyone touch our Jewish heritage. We're going to keep our history to ensure our future. Thank you very much. Now, I, I think that, that, that when we're going to talk about that on the second session, but this site, Joshua's altar, just like Temple Mount, is the place where you have on one side the Jewish people and the Christians, who believe in God and the Bible. And on the other side, you have atheists and you have Muslims. And they are trying to attack, trying to erase those sites that, that give us Bible believers grounds. And you will, you'll find it not only in Jerusalem, not only at Joshua's altar, um, you'll find it anywhere in the biblical heartland of Israel, Judea and Samaria, Hebron, Shiloh, Bethel, anywhere that is biblical is under attack by, by leftists and by atheists, by, by leftists and by Muslims. And you will find it all over Israel as well, unfortunately. Um, so, I just shared with you one uh, angle, one aspect new uh, concerning Joshua's altar. Uh, I would like to share a couple of more angles, but I first want you to meet my teacher friends. So, these are very dear people to me, people that have met with me, have, uh, are meeting with me, are corresponding with me, are talking to me, and we are sharing really fascinating stuff, and I'm going to share some of it with you briefly. Um, but very, very uh, quickly, this is... Professor Rabbi Yoel Elitzur, who lives in my township in Ofra. Uh, he's a, a Bible scholar and a, a, a expert on ancient languages. This is Tzvi Konigsberg. You've heard of him. You know where? Remember that Orthodox Jew that came with the, the book? Of course, it, of course the exodus happened. What do you mean? So this is, this is him. This is Tzvi Konigsberg. Um, this is Yair Shalev, a Bible scholar from the township of Shiloh, Shiloh in Israel. And um, last but not least is Scott Stripling, a Christian archaeologist uh, who is part of an organization called ABR. And uh, Scott has been excavating in the past, uh, I, think, I believe since the 1970s, in our area, searching for the city of Ai. Remember I told you Kathleen Canyon said Ai was already ruined when, when Joshua conquered it. So, so, you know, maybe that's not Ai. Maybe there's, there's another place that is Ai. So Scott has been looking for that. And so these four gentlemen were very helpful uh, to me, and I hope that I was helpful to them. And uh, we did a couple of things together, and I'm going to share that with you. So let's start with Tzvi Konigsberg. Uh, we're going to give you a, I'm going to give you another angle to Joshua's altar. Again, guys, everything I'm telling you right now is new, okay? I haven't spoken about it anywhere. This is really exciting. You're the first one to hear this. Adam Zertal, the archaeologist that found Joshua's altar. Now, we're talking about a ceremony, right? How long was the ceremony? A day? 
maybe two days? What's the chances of finding any monument from a, a, a ceremony or an event that was so short? Yet Adam Zartal writes in his report that the altar was used for 70 years. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible just says, ceremony, blessings, curses, amen, that's it. Right? Wrong. Tzvi Konigsberg is sitting at a Chinese restaurant with me and Eti, and he opens the Bible. He says, open chapter 8 in Joshua. So we open chapter 8. No, we know this chapter. It talks about Joshua performing the, the ceremony. Now he says, open chapter 9. The next chapter. And we're opening it. And what's the story? The story is about the Gibeonites. Remember them? Okay? They were a Canaanite people. They knew that Joshua was going to make war against all the Canaanites. So they disguised themselves as people that came from far away. And uh, they signed a pact with Joshua. And then Joshua found out after the vows and the pact was signed that they cheated him, that, he, that they were actually a Canaanite people and not a people from far away. So he gave them a punishment. What was the punishment? Water bearers and woodcutters. Where? At the altar of Adonai. Okay, this is a chapter after chapter 8. Chapter 8, the ceremony at Joshua's altar. Chapter 9, Gibeonites become the people who will serve the holy place, the temple, and will be the woodcutters and the water bearers. But it says, Mizbeach Adonai. Okay? So, what do we understand from that? We understand that the Israelites made a ceremony of blessings and curses. Okay, this is where the Bible kind of stops. But we understand from chapter 9 and from the archaeological evidence that this site became the Jerusalem. This site was the central site of worshiping and sacrificing for the time of the book of Joshua and part of the book of Judges as well. Okay, this, this was the central place that the Israelites worshipped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Interesting angle, no? Tzvi Konigsberg also says that in the song of the sea, the song of the sea that the Israelites sing after the Red Sea was, was torn, there is a, a verse, Mikdash Adonai Konenu Yadecha, the temple of Adonai, your hands made. I think this, uh, this is my free translation. And Tzvi Konigsberg believes that that's a reference to Mount Tibal, that that is the temple, Mikdash. Now, when we hear temple, we think about a big building, doors, and everything. But this, the, the temple is actually the place of the central place of worship. And at that time, the Israelites were semi-nomadic. They were very simple people. They, they couldn't build a Solomon, Solomonic temple. They were very simple people. So that was, according to Tzvi Konigsberg's belief and mine, the, 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 the central place of worship for the Israelites. What happened after 70 years? Remember that pile of stone? That pile of stone was not the walls of the altar disintegrating. They were put intentionally on the altar to decommission it. Okay, even today, Jews, when we have a Torah scroll, okay, we put it in the Gniza, we, we bury it respectfully. When we have a, a person who passes away, we bury them respectfully. Okay, remember, I don't know if you've ever been to a Jewish cemetery, but Jews take stones and they put them on the tombstone. Okay, this is an ancient ritual that comes from the semi-nomadic way of burial. You, you wouldn't have enough tools to, 
the dig all the way down, so it would be you would have a field burial, and you would put stones. Okay, so so there was a burial of the altar, which really saved it because all they had to do was just to peel away the stones, and they found the altar. And what happened in the year 1150 when this is decommissioned? Shiloh starts working. So you see how the archaeology again works together. Tzvi Konigsberg asked Israel Finkelstein, who was one of the, those minimalist atheist professors who was excavating in Shiloh, when was the site uh, uh, operational? Worshipping-wise, and he said 1150. And then he drove to Mount Ibali, asked Adam Zertal, when was the site decommissioned? 1150. So this is also interesting. Tzvi Konigsberg is a, is a great guy, and thanks to his wife, she translated the book about the footprints that's outside. Next, Scott Stripling. So Scott is a Christian archaeologist, and because he is a Christian archaeologist, his excavations are under a big magnifying glass. Everything that he tests and checks and finds has to be double-checked just to make sure that the results are scientifically correct. Just because he's Christian. He, 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 can't, he can't allow himself to, to fall in any way. So um, he uh, excavated... In, uh, in our area, in Samaria. And uh, one of his places, the, the places that he excavated was Khirbet Makatir. And uh, he believed that that could have been possibly I. So they start digging, and one of the things that they find, they find a, an olive press, an underground olive press. They find a lot of coins dating all the way to one year before the destruction of the temple. And so this is a Jewish community. You have ritual baths all over the place. Um, and you have, as I said, the, the largest concentration of coins from the Second Temple period. And he, he goes down into the olive press and he starts digging and he, get, he sees arrows and he sees nails from sandals of Roman soldiers. And then inside he finds seven skeletons of women and a skeleton of a boy. They were murdered by the Romans inside this olive press. Now, what does an archaeologist do when he finds bones? He takes them, sends them to a laboratory, diagnoses them, and stores them. But not a Christian, evangelical Christian archaeologist. These are Jewish bones of Jewish people. They were defiled for 2,000 years and not buried appropriately. They come to Yoel Elitzu from Ofra, the, the, the rabbi that I just showed you earlier. And they ask him, they, told him they, they tell him, we found skeletons of Jews from 2,000 years ago. Do you want to bury them? Think about this. This is, this is crazy, okay? This is Israel... Bones from 2,000 years ago will, will have a funeral in the year 2019 or 2018. I don't remember exactly when it was. Um, and, and that's exactly what happened. They gave us the bones, and we did a funeral in my township in Ofra. So when you come to the cemetery in Ofra, you see the, the tombstones of, of the residents of Ofra, and on the side you see a tomb, the tomb of the sisters. That's how we call it. Uh, these are Jews that were slaughtered by the Romans 2,000 years ago and today um, are buried respectfully after a Jewish burial. Do you want to see the video of that? <laughs> Is that Starbucks? I don't know. <laughs> so... Um, uh, so, so you, you know, before I share, should I share it now? Okay, I'll share it now. I didn't edit the movie, 
So uh, I will jump from one to the other. Ready? This is the cemetery of Ofra. We are here to do our duty for our mothers 2,000 years ago. In ruins close by to Ofra. They found a Jewish village. It's a Jewish village because they found ritual baths that showed the, the, the purity laws during the Second Temple period. They found a cave, there was a, an olive oil press, the archaeologists dug inside, and they saw skeletons. These are the skeletons that we are about to bury. They sent them to be checked at the University of Weizmann. התברר שמדובר בשבע נשים, שרידים של שבע נשים ונער. הגברים לא היו, או שהיו בקרב, או שנמשכו לקרוץ למערה כך או אחרת. הנשים הללו ניסו כנראה להסתתר. המערה הזאת מחוברת למערכת מסתור של מחילות קטנות ותאי הסתתרות שהתגלו. על שלושה הודו לו, ועל שלושה לא הודו לו. הראשון מהם זה גרר עצמות הפיף. In honor of the dead. He's a reciting the vision of Ezekiel about the dry bones. We are burying the bones under the tree. I have to understand that the archaeologist authorities We're not happy with this, so we have to work fast. Yudha Etzion is asking forgiveness from the dead that they were not buried respectfully 2,000 years ago. We want to hope that they came to a good place we could stand in front of our God and say, this is our duty for them. This is the name of Yoel Elitzur, saying Kaddish. So, this is definitely an exciting event. And, and again, you are the first ones that I share it with. So thanks to Scott Stripling, um, we, we found this amazing finding. Um, I can't say much about the next thing. All I can say is that there is an amazing find in Shiloh. And if Scott's um, theory is right, the next excavation uh, season in Shiloh because of COVID, we don't know when it's going to be. But the next season is going to be very, very exciting for Jews and Christians and those that believe in the Bible. So uh, stay tuned. Um, Mount Ibal. So I told, uh, I told uh, Scott, listen, Scott, you, you have to go to Mount Ibal. This is, you're, you, this is the place you need to go to. And uh, he said, Aaron, take me. And we went together. And I remember standing there beside the altar. It was a cloudy day, a bit rainy. 
And, and you know, we, 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 said, we, stand, we stood there together and we said we really want to continue researching the site, but, but it's problematic. We need God's help. We really need God's help. And we, and we prayed together and we saw a rainbow in the sky. So we, we saw that as a good sign. And, if, and, and then a year after that, uh, Scott comes with a, a big crew and T-shirts with a picture of the altar and a rainbow. And uh, we do a secret operation of wet sifting of the archaeological dump of Professor Adam Zartal from the 1980s. Again, I can't tell you everything, but we found something, and that something is being analyzed uh, here in the United States, and uh, it could be nothing, but it could be everything. Okay, I, I won't say more than that. And, uh, and so this is, um, this is uh, uh, Scott, and back. You see everything? Okay. So, let's continue to my next friend. You, you see, I have very interesting friends, right? Right? I have interesting friends. Um, and it's really, it's really God, if you think about it. God is arranging these encounters, these meetings, for a certain reason. So, Professor Yoel Elitzul, who you, who you saw earlier, um, wrote a book about names of places in the land of Israel, okay? Um, you would assume that names of places in the Bible that uh, existed 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, would be erased, would be forgotten, would be changed. But there's a big miracle, specifically in the land of Israel. The names of, I won't say most, but of many of the biblical sites stayed the same. And this is his project, his life's project. He wrote a book about the biblical names of places and he identifies the places and the names. So one day in 2005, I drive with him. I, he's, a, he's a hitchhiker. He, he came on my car and we started driving from Ophrah to Jerusalem. Had no clue where I lived, okay? I just went there because I, it was a nice community, had a beautiful house and the beautiful and great neighbors. And suddenly we're driving and he's like, you see that tall mountain over there? I said, yeah. He said, you know, this is where Abraham stood in Genesis 13 when God promised him the land. Ramat Chatzot, who asked me about the mountain? Just, you asked me about the mountain. He said, this, this mountain is, according to the Dead Sea, this is where, the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is where Abraham stood. And you see this village over here? This is the village of Bitin. Bitin preserves the name Bethel. You know what happened in Bethel? And I said, yeah, of course I do. Jacob, the ladder, Jeroboam, this, the, the pagan temple of, of the Jeroboam, and, and, and Abraham building altar. It happened here? Yes, it happened here. And you see this village? This village is called Derdibuan, the monastery or the farm of the two bears. Where do we have two bears in the Bible? Elisha. Okay, this is the place where Elisha brought the bears out of the forest to kill the people that scuffled him. Is it, uh, yes. So, this is the place? He said, yeah, it's right here. This is, this is the name of the place. They, they, it's not the name of a, a town. It's the name of the story in this, in this case. And so on and so forth. This is a half an hour drive, and I'm understanding that I'm living in the epicenter of the biblical heartland. This is where everything happened. Okay, this is, this is an encounter that changed my life. And then this guy decides to write another book. And I read that book, and I'm shocked. Okay? And I'm going to talk about the next subject Ephraim, subject you like. Uh, go Ephraim. So we're going to talk about that. 
but, uh, but before I read his book, I met this guy. Okay, Yair Shalev. Yair saw my teaching about Shiloh and the Forgotten Feast in the store of the ancient city of Shiloh. I did a, a TV teaching about a mysterious feast where the girls of Israel would dance in the vineyards. And, 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 and why are they dancing in the vineyards? It's, it's no other than the feast of the Lord. Is that Passover? Is that Pentecost? Is that Shavuot? Is it Pesach? What, what holiday is it? No. The Jewish tradition says this is the 15th day of the month of Av. The day of love. This is the, this is the um, Jewish version of Valentine's Day. Okay? The, the 15th month. But this is not a holiday that's commanded in the Bible. Right? So what is it? Where is it commanded from? Where does it come from? Big question, right? We'll get to that. So Yair Shalev sees my, my teaching. He says, send me, send me the teaching. I don't have money. Just send me to me. I'll watch it. And he watches it. And he says, Aaron, we need to meet. And he sits with me a couple of times. And he teaches me something I never knew. He teaches me the, the Torah of Ephraim. The Torah of Ephraim. Okay. So this is, we have half an hour. Are you ready? This is, the, this is where the roller coaster goes like this. <laughs> ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm so bad. <laughs> okay. So, the events in the Bible really happened. Amen? All the stories in the Bible are historical stories. They, they, are, they, they, they happened in, in a place in the presence of people. They documented them, that, that told their children and grandchildren about them. Correct? Yes. Amen. But is the Bible a history book? Think about this. Is the Bible... What's a history book? A history book pretends to describe everything that happened at a certain time, right? Okay, so for example, 1939, 1945, it will talk about D-Day, it will talk about Hiroshima, it will, it will talk about uh, Midway, it will talk about uh, uh, the Holocaust, right? It will, as much as possible, right? That's a history book. The Bible is not a history book. The Bible is a book of faith. The Bible is a book of morality. It describes historical events, but it doesn't strive to describe all the events. Okay? Uh, it's, like a, it's like you're in a, in a dark room and there's a spotlight. The Bible is showing something. And you're following the light, but you do, you're not aware of everything that's going around. Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. King Josiah, righteous king? Righteous king. How does he die? In battle with? Pharaoh, okay. All we know from the story is that Pharaoh decides to come, to come in with his army into the land of Israel. We don't know where he's going. We don't know why he's going. All we know is that he's in the area of Megiddo. King Josiah is coming to fight him. King Josiah gets wounded and get, gets killed. That's what's relevant to the biblical story. But let's add some archaeological information. Pharaoh Necho is called by the leaders of the Assyrian empire to come and help them fight against the Babil rising Babylonian empire. This is a world war in ancient terms. 
Does the Bible say anything about that? No. Because it's not relevant. Okay? So this is just one story that, that, that shows you the difference between a history book and the Bible describing his, certain historical events. So, what is the flashlight of the Bible at the end of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy? Where does the flashlight lit? It lit on the Israelites. It lit on the Exodus. Right? These, these are the events that really matter. And they are real events. They really happened. Adam Zertal knows that now. He's in heaven, but, but he knows that. Many people, thanks to Adam Zertal, know that as well. But if that's the case, then what's going on on the sides of the flashlight in this room that we're talking about? What's happening on the edges of the light and the darkness? Where, what's going on around us? So, with, with this preface to, to my talk, I'm going to ask you a question. Actually, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. Let's, try, let's start with something weird, okay? Um, the half-tribe of Menashe. Okay, have you ever stopped for a second and asked yourself, why? I mean, first of all, Menashe, the, the tribe of Menashe, had a tribal allotment west of the Jordan River. Why do they need another one in the Golan Heights and the Gilead Mountains. Why? The second question you need to ask yourself is, wasn't, wasn't it bad to be on the eastern side of the Jordan River? Remember how Moses reacted? Which tribes asked Moses to stay behind on the eastern side of the Jordan River? Reuben, God, and the half-tribe of Menashe. No. <laughs> when was the land divided? We'll get to that. When was the land divided between the tribes? Joshua. Joshua. Where? Which city? No. You should say Shiloh. Shiloh. Okay, that's where the tabernacle was. Okay, so, so again, our simple mind wants to make things very simple. So the land was divided in Shiloh. But when you read the Bible carefully, you see that before the land was divided in Shiloh, it was divided by Moses because he gave parts of the land to Reuben, God, and the half-tribe of Menashe, right? So it's a bit more complex. Okay, so let's summarize. Shiloh and Moses at the plains of Moab, right? Wrong. Jacob's time. Remember... Jacob comes and, and Jacob has, has children, right? Okay, the Bible doesn't say this. This is, I'm, I'm coming, I'm, this, is, this is my invention, okay? You, you can take it, you, 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 can, you cannot take it. But every family that has, a, has parents that are, are old, they start talking. Who will take this? Who will take that? Right? So, so God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the land will be theirs. Okay, it's very natural to imagine the brothers talking about the places that are going to be theirs. In fact, after Joseph is sold to Egypt, 
What happens? There's a weird story. Judah leaves his family and goes to Adullam. Adullam is a city or a village in the tribal land of Judah. Now, at that time, Joseph is considered dead, right? So there are only 10 brothers to, to divide the, the land with, right? This is, I'm inventing this, right? It's not, I'm inventing. And then Joseph is found, right? And Joseph has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim and Manasseh, Jacob says, are going to be like my children. They're also going to get tribal lands. Right? But it doesn't end there. What does he do? He blesses them. And he says that I will give you Shechem. I will give you the city of Shechem, the city I took from the Amorites with my bow and arrow. So, there's an early division here, okay? This is clear. This is written in the Bible. Shechem will be Joseph's. And Joseph is buried in Shechem. So this is, so this, it's, it's, it's complicated, guys. It's not just Shiloh. It's Jacob's time. We see this with Judah. It's after Joseph was found, before entering Canaan, and Shiloh. In other words... When the Israelites arrive at the plains of Moab and they're about to cross into the land of Israel, they already have an idea where they're going to be at. Some of the tribes know where they're going to be at. When Moses stands on the mountain and he sees the, the land before he dies, he actually blesses the tribes going from south to north. Judah, and then Levi, because Levi is Hebron, it's a Levite city. And then Benjamin. This is, the, this is the order in the Bible. And then Ephraim, and then Menashe, and then Issachar. It's just, it's, this is the order that Moses blesses the tribes. Moses knows already where the tribes are going to be at. Guys, this is, this is the roller coaster. We're starting going down, okay? Next, we're asking questions. Going back to, to where we left. Which tribes asked Moses to stay east of the Jordan River? Reuven and Menashe. Only... God and Reuben asked Moses to stay behind. And Moses is angry at Reuben and God for staying behind. And Reuben and God say to Moses, we will be the first ones to fight in Canaan. And only after we conquer the land of Canaan, we're going back home. Moses says, okay. And then he gives the lands to Reuben, God, and the half-tribe of Menashe. Even though the half-tribe of Menashe never asked for it. You like it? So why did Moses allocate the Gilead and Bashan to half the half tribe of Menashe. And why did the tribe of Menashe receive another tribal land west of the Jordan? Okay, legitimate questions. Why did the Israelites cross the Jordan after defeating King Sihon the Amorite? Okay, you have to picture it. The people of Israel defeat the king of Sichon. We just learned it on Shabbat, right? They are at the plains of Moab, directly in front of Jericho. 
The next step is, what do they do? North, go fight King Og. By the way, King Og is where? Golan Heights. Things are connecting. Bashan, Gilead, half-tribe of Menashe, Og. Why are the Israelites going northward to fight instead of going westward into the land of Israel? Quiz. Then they turned and went up along the road toward Bashan and Og, king of Bashan. And his whole army marched out to meet them in a battle at Edrei. Okay? They, they didn't, he didn't attack them and they went up north. They went up north and he was threatened and came to attack them. Next. Ready? Why did the tribe of Menashe grow so rapidly in the second census? Okay, we have a census in the Mount, Mount Sinai, the counting of the number of Israelites. Every tribe has a number. And then we have a second census at the plains of Moab. The numbers of the tribes are almost the same. This is the curse of the generation that will die in the desert. Exactly the almost exactly the same number. There are two tribes that have a, 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 a large change, a big change in their numbers. The tribe of Simeon has an enormous decrease probably because of what their president did with Kozbi Batsu, the Midianite. Okay, we, we, we just read it, and we're going to continue reading it next week. Apparently, the tribe of Simeon was very sinful, and they got it. Okay? But there's another tribe that has a big change, the tribe of Menashe. An addition of 20,000 men. Either the women of Menashe were very fruitful or these guys came from somewhere. <laughs> these are the numbers. Census at Mount Sinai, 32,500. And Plains of Moab, 52,700. Why was there a need for the covenant of the plains of Moab? Okay, we have a covenant in Mount Sinai. We have a covenant at Mount Ibal. Why is there a covenant at the plains of Moab? There are the terms of the covenant the Lord commanded Moses to make with the Israelites in Moab. In addition to the covenant he had made with them at Horeb, at Sinai. Okay, so you would think Mount Sinai is enough. The, all the Israelites came out of Egypt. All the Israelites got the Torah. All the Israelites were in the desert. All of them were the plains of Moab for another covenant. Why? They crossed and did another covenant at Mount Ibal. Why? Mount Sinai is enough. Why do two more? They messed up. That's a, that's, that's a good answer, and that's exactly what the sages say. Plains of Moab, they messed up with Baal Peo. But Mount Ibal? Joshua's time was very righteous. I mean, aside from the sin of uh, Ai, of, of Jericho, sorry. Um, they were pretty righteous. So there was really no reason to do another covenant. But... There could be many reasons for every covenant, and we're going to talk about that. Why do the residents of Gilead have a different dialect? Where, where, where do we see that? Very good. You're amazing. Okay, judges. Remember, we say in Hebrew, Yiftach. You say, Jeff, Jeff, Jeftach? Jeftach? Is it okay if I use the Hebrew? Yiftach, okay? Yiftach fights against 
the Ammonites and the Ephraim from the west, from Canaan, are coming to, to Gilead, to, to Yiftach. They're saying, why didn't you call us? This means war. And they start a civil war amongst the brothers, Ephraim and Menashe. And Menashe, or Yiftach, fights them and kills them. And there's the, he sends guards to the bridges on the Jordan River to stop them from going to the west side. And how does he differentiate the Ephraimites from the, the, the other people in, in the east, on the east side? Accent, okay? He says, you say the word shibolet, which means wheat. Okay? If they say shibolet, if they say sibolet, instead of shin, sin, then they're not from our people. Okay? That's what's written. So, that, so, so, but this, this is weird. I have to tell you it's weird. Why is it weird? Because both letters, shin and sin, are letters in Hebrew. They're, 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 there's, there's totally no reason whatsoever that the east side and the west side will not be able to say both letters to pronounce them the right way. So Bible scholars say it's not shibolet and sibolet. It's shibolet and thibolet. Thibolet is in Proto-Canaanite or Aramaic turbulence. What happens when you ask an Israeli to say, I think? What do they say? I think. Because it's hard for them to say, th. It's not, it's not, we don't have a, a sound like that. But in the Arabs can make that sound. The Proto-Canaanites knew how to make that sound. Proto-Canaanites are the Canaanites from the early times, from the early Bronze Age, from the middle Bronze Age, from the late Bronze Age, before the Israelites came in. Are you seeing where I'm getting at? We're jumping to the prophets. Micah. Guys, this is something that I just, at you remember? I, I, I'm, learning, I'm, learning, I'm just learning the 12 prophets. And I, I was reading Micah. And I, and I, and I suddenly I, I read this. Do you get, do you, does this happen to you? It happens to you. It it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's, you read something and suddenly, whoa. <gasps> And it was there for thousands of years, but, <gasps> wow. Okay? Micah. Micah is talking about how God is going to lead the Israelites. Okay? He's going to lead the Israelites just like he led them out of Egypt. Right? Almost right. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance which lives by itself in a forest. In fertile pasture lands, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days long ago. As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them my wonders long ago. Sorry, that's, that's a mistake. So what is mentioned before Egypt? What is mentioned before Egypt? God will lead them. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days long ago. Something before Egypt. This is before Egypt. God led them to Gilead and Bashan. Okay. Are you ready? I'm going to connect the dots. 
The Bible doesn't say that. Okay? This is not where the flashlight is. It's around. Okay? But Bible scholars believe that while the Israelites are in Egypt, there are Israelites in Canaan. Okay? Now, it's hard for us to grasp because, again, in our simple mind, Jacob, Egypt, Exodus, Mount Sinai Desert, Canaan. Right? That's the spotlight. But when you see these questions arise, where do these 20,000 people come from? Why is there a different dialect? Why are they not talking the same way the Israelites are? Why are the Israelites coming out of Egypt, going up north suddenly to do something that they need to do? Maybe the half-tribe of Menashe wasn't sinful because the Golan and the Gilead were supposed to be part of the Promised Land, unlike the areas of Reuben and God. And if so, maybe there were Israelites there living, waiting for their brothers and sisters to come from Egypt. You like the roller coaster? They're scattered. Okay. So we're, we're, we're dealing with Menashe. Now let's go to the other son of Joseph. Were the Israelites absent from Canaan while they were in Egypt? Chronicles 7, 20 to 27. Here, we don't have a flashlight that shows or nothing. It's on the edge of the light. Okay? I need to finish, so we'll do this quickly. Why don't I have it? Sorry. Be with you in a minute. Chapter 7. Sorry. Chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 20. I need glasses. It's the age. Okay, chapter 8. Ready? The lineage of Ephraim. Chapter 8, chapter 7, Chronicles 1, uh, verse 20. And the sons of Ephraim, Shutelach and Bered his son, and Tachat his son, and El Ada his son, and Tachat his son, and Zavad his son, and Shutelach his son, and Ezer and El Ad, whom the men of Gat that were born in the land slew because they came down to take away their cattle? Wait a second. Ephraim is the son of Joseph. Ephraim is living in Egypt. Ephraim is Egyptian royalty. His mom is Osnat Bat Potifera, the daughter of Potifera, the priest of On. Why is this happening in the area of Gat, which is a city in Canaan. Cattle? They slew his children there? What's going on? And Ephraim, their father, mourned many days, and his brothers came to comfort him. And he went on to his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. And he called his name Beriah, because evil had befallen his house. And, this, and his daughter, listen to this, his daughter, was She'era, who built both the lower and the upper Bet Horon and Uzen She'era, a descendant of Ephraim, his daughter or his granddaughter, built cities in, not Egypt, Canaan. Bet Horon and Bet, Bet Horon Elion and Bet Horon Tachton are identified with the Arab village Bet Ur El Fuk and Bet Ur El Tachta. Okay, so this is in the Bible, clearly, Israelites, Ephraimites, in the land, building towns in the tribal land 
that is going to be theirs. More questions. We're going to do this quickly. Why isn't Shechem and Shiloh mentioned in the cities that were conquered by Joshua? Shechem and Shiloh are very important cities. Why aren't they conquered by Joshua? Maybe because he doesn't have to conquer them. Were the Israelites absent? Oh, we did that. No, 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 no. Okay, now it's here. Thank you. Who are the native born present at the ceremony of the blessings and the curses on Mount Iba? Remember that? They're natives. The natives. We found them. What is the annual feast of the Lord in Shiloh? Remember we talked about the 15th day of the month of Av, the girls were dancing in the vineyards. A feast that is not commanded on Mount Sinai, but is celebrated by the Israelites and called the feast of the Lord. So, we're talking about Israelites that are living in Canaan, in the area of the, the mountain of Ephraim and the half-tribe of Menashe, while their Israelite brothers and sisters are in Egypt. So, what happens in Mount Sinai? We have the Israelites that came out of Egypt, the Egyptian Israelites in Mount Sinai. But who's not there? Ephraim and Menashe. The, the, the Israelite Israelites. Okay, they're not there. They don't know what Shavuot, Pesach, and, and, and Sukkot is. Think about this. We have two different Israelites. We have Sinaitic Israelites, and we have Israelites that believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that circumcise, that don't eat the the, the uh, remember Jacob fought the angel? They know that story. There are certain things that they keep, but they don't know Sinai. So why do you need to do a covenant in the plains of Moab? Why do you need to do a covenant on Mount Ibal? You need to bring Sinai to the natives. Thank you.